welcome to Etz Chaim, which means the Tree of Life. We're a messianic congregation that understands that Jesus is Yeshua, our Messiah, and He wants us to follow the Torah just as He did. Come check us out. You're invited to join us for our Saturday service at 1 p.m. You can also gain valuable insights at our 4 p.m. Bible study. Your questions are welcome. And now, with a weekly Torah reading, Rabbi Mordecai Silver. This week's portion is Chayes Sarah. It means life of Sarah. It's Genesis 23, 1 through 25, 18. The Haftorah portion is 1 Kings 1, 1 through 31. The introduction. As Isaac walks in the field toward evening, he looks up and sees camels approaching. Rebecca asks of Eleazar who he is. He tells her it is Isaac, the son of his master Abraham. Some time after they are married, Abraham's noble life comes to an end at the age of 175 years. Old and contented, he is gathered to his kin and buried near his wife, Sarah, in the cave of Machpelah. Genesis 24, 62-67 Now Isaac had returned from Ber Lehi Ro and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah. And she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. It's kind of interesting, the marriage practice in those days as compared to today. Of course, the first thing was is that Abraham sent out his servant to find his wife. It isn't like they do today where you date, you find somebody interesting, the sparks fly, and all these other kind of things and everything like that. It was an arranged marriage. They didn't know one another until they saw each other for the first time. And what would have happened if Isaac didn't like her? You know, he had the right to refuse. He didn't have to do it, and so did she. She also had the right of refusal. But it was an arranged marriage. But yet, you could see that they connected. And the interesting thing about it is, is that the practice of an arranged marriage is for the most part, what it is is that they, the, they believe that love will come and develop in the relationship. It's not, it's not supposed to be about a physical attraction. It's supposed to be about a mutual respect for one another. And that's what it's supposed to be. And so it's a reflection of our relationship with the Messiah. I mean, how many of us fall in love with him immediately? Not everybody falls in love with him immediately. Come now. You know that as much as I do, particularly the Jewish people, okay? Do you think I fell in love with the Messiah the first time somebody, you know, introduced me to him? When they said, you need Jesus! And I said, who? I didn't know who it was. You know, come on. Kind of interesting when they do that. And it kind of reminded me when I was reading through this passage for this week about the Jewish people, because the Jewish people have been deliberately blinded to the truth of Messiah in order that those who are not Jews, the Gentiles, the nations, were able to receive the truth of Messiah. It was part of God's plan. It's still a part of God's plan. There are not as many Jewish people who believe in the Messiah as there are Christians in the church. There's not as many Jews as there are Gentiles. Come on, you know, that's just the way that it is. But yet, in God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, everyone who believes the way that Abraham did becomes part of the seed. You become part of the seed of Messiah. We all need Messiah. Even the Jewish people need the Messiah. They just don't realize it yet. But more and more are seeing that now. And it's kind of interesting, when I looked at this passage, and Rebecca is saying to the servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? 
She didn't know who it was until the servant said, it is my master. Well, isn't that the same reaction that a lot of us have? Who is Yeshua to us? How do we know who he is? Until we realize or somebody tells us, he's the Messiah, he's your master. And he is our master because who else should we follow? Who else is there for us? Everything that we see in Scripture tells us about the relationship that our ancestors had with the Lord. And they were looking forward and knew about the promise of the Mashiach, of the Messiah. And they knew that he was a promise there. And according to, and how you interpret Scripture is how you interpret Scripture. It's, you know, your personal view or your revelation of scripture is that the messiah revealed himself to our ancestors he didn't reveal himself in the way that he would come when we come into the apostolic scriptures of the new testament but he revealed himself into them that they realized that he was the lord how many of us today have that type of relationship how many of us could walk with the lord the way that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob walk with him. How many of us, when we're trying to get away from our attachment to the world, and we're trying to pull away and follow the way that the Messiah wants us to follow, do we have the tendency to look back? Because we can't let go of it. And we've got to be careful because if we look back too much, it's going to pull us back. It's going to drag us back into the world. Because you've got to keep your eyes focused on the Messiah if you want to move forward. In John 12, starting in verse 37. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. For us, uh, for Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. 2 Corinthians three fourteen to 16 But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Messiah is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. The apostle is talking about the Jewish people. He has blinded their eyes and he hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. What does he mean, and be converted and I heal them? Turn them back to God. Because they had turned away from him. They hardened their hearts against him. And this is not just about the Jewish people. This is about all of Israel and all of us. Because we're part of Israel. We become part and parcel of God's people through our faith in Messiah and following his teachings. And where do we find his teachings? In the Torah. There's nothing new in the New Testament that hasn't already been covered in the Torah and the prophets. I always love it when Yeshua had said in there, when he said that the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms, they testify of me. They testify of me. Why didn't he quote from the New Testament about it? There wasn't any. 2,000 years ago, there was no such thing as the New Testament. It didn't exist. Everything that they did they did from the Torah, the Prophets, and the Psalms. So, if the Torah, the Prophets, and the Psalms were good enough for them, why isn't it good enough for us? And I'm not saying that we take the apostolic scriptures of the New Testament and throw it away. We use that to enhance our understanding and our relationship with the Messiah. Everything should work together. There should be no such thing as the old or the new. It's one Bible. At least that's the last time I looked at it, it was one Bible. And if it's one Bible, you should, t I know some people that have done it. You, any page that says Old Testament or New Testament, tear it out, make it one book. I know some people would go, ah, you're violating scripture. Well, Old and New Testament was never written in and part of it. 
All right, so you don't need that definition in there. Genesis to Revelation. One Bible, one book. Nothing else. Psalm 33, 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in Him, because we have trusted in His holy name. Isn't David a contradiction? He's a man of war. He becomes king of all Israel. He unites it. He begins to build Israel. He rules over Israel for 40 years. And yet, he writes the Psalms, which are so beautiful. He cries out to God for his help. And yet, he had one of the most dysfunctional families that we'll ever find in the Bible. I guess you compare David's family to Jacob's family. They were dysfunctional. I mean, just have to read it. I, can't, I don't make it up. It's in Scripture. God doesn't hide it. He wants us to learn from it. What do we learn from it? That polygamy isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Did God outlaw polygamy in the Bible? No, he did not outlaw polygamy. But he set an example for us. How many wives did he bring to Adam in the beginning? One. Except for one mention of polygamy in the Bible, because it doesn't go into detail, all other aspects of polygamy in the Bible have produced nothing but heartache and trouble. And yet a lot of places, there's a lot of things that they do besides polygamy and other things that they tolerate. They tolerate sins that transgress God's law, God's teachings, God's instructions. And yet we begin to accept it more and more and more because society, once something is pushed on you and you get comfortable with it or you've heard it enough or seen it enough, it doesn't bother you anymore. And yet there are a lot of things that are going on out there that should bother us. We read about things in Scripture and we look at these things and go, Oh my goodness, look, how could that happen in the Bible? Look at the world around you. The Bible is a reflection of us. There is no new sin. Everything has already been talked about and discussed and shown to us in Scripture. Hebrews 2.12, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Revelation 19.7-9, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. It's not talking about the bride here. It's talking about everyone who's invited to the marriage supper. If you're not invited to the marriage supper, you have a problem. They're talking about God's kingdom here. If you're not invited to the wedding supper, you're not in God's kingdom. You're not part of God's kingdom. You need to reflect on that. You need to think about that. Why haven't you received an invitation? Well, maybe you did receive the invitation, but you haven't responded. Yeshua is waiting for you. He stands at the door and knocks. You know, I've talked about that before. Messiah has done. What else do you want him to do for you? He died for you. He offered himself up. He allowed his body to be broken and his blood to be shed. And he took all of our sins upon himself. He was resurrected from the grave. And he stands at the door, at your door, and he's knocking at your door. And are you answering? Or are you going, who the heck is knocking at my door? People, when you hear that knock, you better be responding or there's a problem in the end. Revelation 13, 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Did you hear what it said? Whose names have not been written in the book of life 
of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the nations will bow down and they will worship Yeshua and yet their names are not in his book of life. And if you're not in the book of life, you're lost. So you need to reflect upon your relationship with him. 1 Kings 1, 22 to 30. While she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet came in. And they told the king, Here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed before the king, with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord the king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down this day and has sacrificed oxen, fatted cattle, and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the king's sons, the commanders of the army, and Abihithar the priest, And behold, they are eating and drinking before him and saying, Long live King Adonijah. But me, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon he has not invited. Has this thing been brought about by my lord the king? And you have not told your servants who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Then King David answered, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore, saying, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, even so will I do this day. Absalom, Adonijah, and Solomon were sons of King David by three different wives. Absalom was the son of Makkah. Adonijah's mother was was Hagith, and Solomon was the son of Bathsheba. Absalom rebelled against his father. He tried to take his throne, tried to kill his father. How more dysfunctional of a family can you get where the son's trying to kill his father over a throne? So it's kind of interesting, you know, when you think about Absalom wanted the throne. Couldn't wait until his father died. Couldn't wait to see if maybe he would be named to that. He wanted it. And he did, for a time, drive his father out of Jerusalem. But the end result was, is that Absalom wasn't the one that was meant to sit on the throne. And he was killed. He died. And yet David didn't want him to die. David wanted him to be spared. But he didn't want to listen. So Joab took it into his own hands, and he did what was necessary to make sure that David's throne would be secure. And kind of interesting after that, because then David, when he hears that Absalom is dead, he goes in the morning for him. And he's told, what are you doing? Do you know the example that you're setting here? Your own son was your enemy and tried to kill you? So he died as a result of that rebellion, and yet you're there acting the way that you're acting? It's almost like it's slapping it across the face and saying, get it together, guy. And David got it together. And now here you have another thing, Adonijah. He wants to be king. Is he going to wait until he sees what David's going to do? No, he goes out. He gets a priest to back him up. He gets a general of the army to back him up. He gets a prophet to back him up. And he goes out. And he gets the people on his side. And they sing his praises. And then he goes out and he makes all these things. And then he basically takes the crown. His father's not even dead yet. And he takes the crown for himself. And lo and behold, Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba, They get together and they talk about the situation and what's going on and they get their plan together and they don't try to go around David. They go right to David. And they put it to David. Who is going to be your successor? And the end result is that would be Solomon who would be his successor. Well, you all know the story about Adonijah after that one and what happened. As soon as he found out that Solomon had been declared king and that he was going to be the next one that was there, he goes running for the temple. 
He goes running inside and he grabs onto the horns of the altar. He thinks that that's going to save him. Why would you ha grab onto the th th horns of the altar where the sacrifices are made all the time? Well, we all know what happened to Adonijah. They didn't put him on the altar and sacrifice him. But he died because he tried to take the throne that wasn't meant for him. You know, what did we learn from this? Isn't that what Satan's trying to do? Is he not trying to take the throne from Yeshua? Is he not trying to take it and make it his own? Because he believes that he can go around God? Satan was created by God. When will the creation learn that you're not greater than the creator? But Satan will never learn. Because scripture tells us what's going to happen to him in the end for trying to do what he tried to do. The Bible talks about it over and over and over again. It's people who try to take a throne, who try to raise themselves up higher than God and what happens to them. We need to learn. And it's our responsibility as parents the same way that our Heavenly Father teaches us also. In Proverbs 22, 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's our responsibility in order to do this. And it's not just about those of us who are parents who have children. But what about those of us who are a little bit further along in our walk than other people? Isn't it our responsibility to try to help them along in their walk? Try to set the example for them. Try to explain to them what it is that we're about and what we're trying to do. We're not trying to save ourselves through the power of what the Torah is. The Torah is a compendium of teachings and regulations that God gave to his people. The Torah cannot save you, but the Torah can point you to the one who can. And at the heart of the Torah is Yeshua. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 26. But each one in his own order, Messiah the firstfruits, afterward those who are Messiahs at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Messiah is the first fruits. He is the fulfillment of the festival of first fruits. Or, as it also is known, the Omer or the wave offering. It comes in the springtime. It's one of the spring festivals. It's not one that God tells us that we have to do anything particular, but God does point it out in there about the first fruits. What are the first fruits? The best of the harvest. We are the best of the harvest. Anyone who belongs to Messiah is the first fruits along with him. But you know what it says here, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. Yeshua will turn the throne back over to his Father. And the end result is, from what we learned in our study in Revelation, is that the Father and the Son will both rule from Jerusalem. But what we learn here is, is what we, as a lesson for all of us, is that Yeshua does as his Father asks of him, no questions asked, does whatever is needed, Submits himself to his father in all things. And if he does that, what should we learn from that? Matthew 26, 39. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This is when Yeshua was in the garden. It was in that moment before he was going to be taken and then his trials would start and would wind up with his crucifixion and his death. And some people would say, well, this shows that he couldn't be perfect in here because he said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Yeshua knew what he was facing. 
He knew what was coming. What we see here is his humanity. We see his humanity, but he didn't let his humanity steer him away from what his father required of him. He submitted fully to his father. And he said to him, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Perfectly submitted to his father. Could we do the same thing? Can we do the same thing? In Hebrews 2.17, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make appropriation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This wraps it up very nicely here. He was made like us so he would know what we go through. He set the example for us. He wanted to show us that you could indeed live a life perfect and pleasing unto God. He became like we were. It says, so he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make appropriation for the sins of the people. Once he was aware of what the people went through, he could be a better intermediary between us and God. And this is what he did for us. He himself has suffered when tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. So people, when you think that you can't bear up under the temptations, the trials, the tribulations that you are going through in your own life, think of what Yeshua bore up with and went through for us. And if he made it to the end, we can make it to the end. to our television audience come and enjoy yourself through our website you can find all kinds of materials all kinds of videos all kinds of audio teachings all kinds of written teachings then join us on our discussion site our forum Torah Talk Shalom everyone Shalom everyone